I'm delighted to be here. I really am. Very honored to be here. 34 years of friendship, uh, 35 with Tracy. And I am just shocked you would have the crazy old Asian back. The last time I was here, the movie The Crazy Rich Asians had come out, and people actually asked me after the message, are you Chinese? And I'm not. I'm, I'm Japanese American, all right? And that's going to play into some of our talk here this morning. Um, thank you to Pastor Darren and Tracy and your grandparents now. That's such an awesome... We, we visited with, with Mia. We visited with Mia last night. And so it's just wonderful. This is a very special church. This is a very challenging area um, for people to come to know God. And what you have grown here with health at Brave is very special. You're not here by accident. The Lord has drawn you here. And every one of you have a very special purpose to discover and to fulfill. Fast Track will help you understand that. And so I want to echo what Pastor Darren just said. This is a great church. I don't say this in every church I go to. But this is a great church whose future will be amazing. And so that means you're amazing. Somebody say amen in the house. That's right. Agree with that. Um, before the day is done, if I forget, I will tell you who's going to win the Super Bowl. Sometimes the Lord gives us prophetic insight into this. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> yeah, um, and I've rarely been wrong. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> see, now you, 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 you're going, I, I just, the women are going, I, I'm not going to be able to really focus on the message since you said that. I need to know now before you preach who's going to win the Super Bowl, as if many of you care, because Oakland's not in it, right. right? All right. In the book of Genesis is the riveting story of Joseph and his 11 brothers. His father's name is Jacob, the patriarch. Joseph is the second youngest of 12 boys. From these 12 boys would come the people of Israel, which would become what we know today as the nation of Israel. The problem is Joseph is arrogant. God gives him dreams about the fact he's going to be a big-time leader one day. And so finally, the brothers are so fed up, they sell him into slavery. You, they, they put him in a pit. He ends up in Potiphar's house, the captain of the guard to Pharaoh. He is wrongly accused of rape. He is then tossed into a prison and for two years languishes in hopelessness. Yet, his faith in God does not waver. And scripture says, the favor that he demonstrates causes them to understand that the Lord in bad times is with him. Well, a famine hits the land. Pharaoh has a dream and he needs some answers. He needs to have someone tell him what the dream was and what it means. Joseph is summoned because no one can do it. And in a moment, Joseph reveals to Pharaoh the meaning of the dream, and he's promoted from the prison right into the palace, and he's set over all of the kingdom. Thirteen years have elapsed. The famine in the land causes his father Jacob to send his sons to Egypt to get some grain and some food. They don't know that the brother that they think has died is in charge now. And so they come to Joseph, and by now Joseph cannot hold himself back any longer because God has done a work in his heart. And that's where we pick up the story by visual on your beautiful movie screen. Take a look at this TNT classic segment. What a riveting moment. Today, the team that will win the Super Bowl, no doubt, will have a unity in the locker room. What happens in the locker room also plays out on the field. But beyond that athletic field, it's the field of life. That was a locker room moment of a family that was divided. And after 13 years, because the Holy Spirit had worked, what was divided became undivided. We're heading to Valentine's Day soon. Men, that's an advance warning. <laughs> and relationships 
are going to be celebrated, unfortunately, some relationships are going to be terminated. It's going to be a joyous time for some and a very uncomfortable time for some. And this morning, in lieu of the Super Bowl and Valentine's Day, I felt led to talk to you about being undivided. Four things we take away from this incredible story. Number one, if we're going to have Super Bowl winning relationships, choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. The book of Colossians says, put, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved and compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. The great apostle Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, he, he says, look, you must forgive. There's an imperative. In other words, forgiveness, which means letting go, is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's a decision. You remember Jesus talking to Peter. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And as many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. What was Peter doing? Peter was kind of had a linebacker mentality. He was a bruiser. He was a rough fishing businessman. And tradition says he could bully people. And so he was kind of goading Jesus as knowing the Jewish law says extend forgiveness three times and then you have a legal option to exact reasonable retribution. And Jesus is blowing his tank. He says, no, 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 not, 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 not seven times. Peter, Peter thought he was being generous. He knew it was three times in Jewish law. He says, seven times? Jesus goes, no, Peter, 77 times. What was Jesus saying? Choose to forgive. Choose to forgive as often as is necessary so your heart can remain healthy. It's a choice, it's not an emotion. We get a picture of what forgiveness is by what Paul writes. He says, put on. That word in the original language means to put on a jacket just like I put this on. In Hawaii, we don't wear jackets. Okay, some of us don't wear clothes there, actually. It's so, it's so warm. I, when I travel, I have to wear a suit sometimes. Thank you, Darren, I don't have to do that here. Do I feel like it? No. Did I feel like wearing a 20-year-old turtleneck, turtleneck? Like, you know, I have only one. This is it right here. It's the same one I wore last time. Some of you are probably going, did you wear that the last time? <laughs> this jacket I never wear unless I, I come here to the continent. I have to choose to put it on. And if I don't choose to put it on, I freeze. But in the hotel room where I turn up the thermostat to 75, yeah, some of you are going, man, that's wet box temperatures. I can feel like I don't need it. But when I go outside, I realize I need it. So when I'm inside, I choose to put on what I don't feel like wearing. That's forgiveness. And some of us here this morning, once again, we are reminded we need to choose to forgive. Just like Brady had to forgive Bilicek and Bilicek had to forgive Kraft for trading away Garoppolo. They probably need Derek Carr, actually. <laughs> Brother, okay. Who do you need to forgive? Because that could be the sticking point to a breakthrough in every other point of your life. Remember, forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision, all right? And when we forgive, here's something to encourage us all. Here's what scripture says in the book of Romans. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I've known the Lord for 44 years. And what I found when I forgive people, God deals with people. That's not why we should forgive. But when I forgive, I put them in the hands of God. And then God works on their hearts the change that I would desire that doesn't begin until I forgive. And so what I'm saying here in our first point, is if you forgive people that have offended you, you release God to work in their soul. And it's a choice. You can feel hate, but you can choose to forgive, and God honors the decision and doesn't look at the emotion because you're being honest. It means to put on, Paul is writing, put on a garment on the outside, and eventually what you put on on the outside will become reality on the inside. That's a faith move. Anytime we move in faith, God moves in a special manner. He may not do it immediately, but as we persevere, 
in forgiveness, you'll find that God will work towards bringing together relationships that have fractured. Now, here's the second thing. Allow time for healing. Allow time for healing. Scripture says that for, for everything, there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to what? A time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up. There's a time for healing, and healing takes time. Our heart is a muscle, and when our heart is fractured and broken, it takes time to heal. The truth of it is, when we choose to forgive, then healing begins, and not any time before that. When we choose to forgive, we unleash the Holy Spirit to heal us on the inside, but it begins by us putting on the garment of forgiveness on the outside. Now, Joseph had, thir he had 13 plus years to pray, to ponder, to reflect. From the pit, to Potiphar's house, to prison. 13 years, this 17-year-old adolescent, God was forming him and transforming him through difficult, difficult times. And as he pondered, as he processed, and as he reflected, God changed him on the inside and made him ready to engage a reconciliation and to unify what had been divided. Some of you are in the healing mode right now. You feel betrayed. You're offended. You've been lied to, maybe manipulated. Choose to forgive and allow God to heal your heart. And say, Lord, heal me on the inside. I do not want the hurt that I feel to be my reality, but by faith, I call on you with the element that pleases you to mend the muscle of my heart. That's a genuine prayer. A genuine, genuine prayer. And then reconcile gradually and only if possible. Before I go there, allow me to tell you a story. In 1977, when I was coming into my ministry career as a campus, college campus leader, I was in Bible college and an intern with our church. A woman made an accusation against me. Now, I got some of you that were looking at your notes just looked up. You go, are you part of the Me Too movement? Are you one of them guys? Okay, so I'm just sharing this because it has a good ending. There were 13 accusations made against me. I was brought up before the elder board. I walked into the office and 12 men in a semicircle were looking at me and there was a chair in front of, those, of that semicircle and I, and I was a part of an inquisition because normally when a woman makes an accusation against you, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're right. Except this time. Though there was nothing sexual about the accusations, this highly educated supervisor of, of a whole floor of Hawaii's leading hospital was very believable. I was only about three years old in the Lord at that time, and she was a veteran. And I said, this is really bad on all levels. This is not good at all. I was very angry. I had visions of her experiencing some catastrophe, catastrophe in her life that would be very ungodly. But I was honest. I said, Lord, help me. I've been taught about forgiveness from your word. And I choose to forgive. And I had to choose to forgive so much, way beyond 77 times before I entered that room. And when I entered that room, I will tell you that's a moment. And I said, Lord, please honor your word. As she read those, the list, my blood boiled. But in the midst of a, my blood that was boiling, I, I grit my teeth. I said, I choose to forgive Francine. I choose to forgive Francine. Did I feel it? No. <laughs> I feel like killing Francine. I choose to forgive Francine. The meeting went two hours. And then finally, towards the end of the session, one of the elders who had a kind of a prophetic anointing, he was my Bible college dean, he stood up and he said, I've been praying here and he said, you're lying. You have unresolved issues from having been abused by men in your past, and you're projecting it onto Norman. I believe the Lord has shown me this, and this is your opportunity to be healed in your heart. And I was like, yes, somebody said something. Oh, at last. It was, it was unbearable, the tension in the room for me. 
She got up immediately, ranted, and ran out of the room, cussing. And then the room went silent. In my mind, I went, will somebody help a brother? Because here's what I was thinking. <laughs> what were the other 11 elders thinking? It was one thing for my Bible college dean to have the revelation. But the other 11 guys still kind of were looking at me like, well, maybe he did it. Maybe he did all those things. I had to live with that tension for years. It would be a few years later, just gotten married. I got a phone call. And it was this woman. She said, I'm calling from a mental institution. And I have learned that I need to ask you to forgive me for lying. I knew immediately who it was on the line. My wife knew immediately who it was on the line, just by the tone. Amazing. And I, immediately what I said was, Francine, I, I forgave you back then, and of course, I forgive you. Please be released. It was a very gracious conversation. And she said, you know, because I've held bitterness towards you and to men that have abused me in my past, it has come to this, where I am a master degree nurse committed to an institution, but I know my release depends on my forgiving, you forgiving me, and speaking truth. I realized my heart had healed over the few years. I had chose to forgive in a few years earlier, but it took a few years for my heart to heal enough where without malice, I could, I could declare a release to myself and to that person. Who do you need to release? Where do you need to be released this morning? And in that healing, in that, those 13 years, in that journey, Joseph's heart healed. It started healing in the pit. It continued to heal in spite of what happened in Potiphar's house. It continued to heal in the prison. And all of a sudden, in a moment, because his heart had healed, God brought a unified reconciliation with Joseph and his brothers. God can do that. He can do that for all of us, for any of us. Then, reconcile gradually and only if possible, which is the point at which I left you with before the pause. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It is not always possible, but it's probable that you can reconcile a relationship when there has been a restoration of trust. The foundation of all relationships is trust. But trust, once lost, is only reclaimed over a period of time. Often, we, we, we confuse forgiveness with trust. They are related, but they are two entirely separate concepts. Forgiveness is unconditional and immediate. Trust is earned gradually over time as there is a change in character and behavior. I have a master's in Christian counseling. I've counseled many married couples and the Christian fallacy that if you forgive, you should forget and you should just come back together and be good buddies because if you really forgive, you should just reconcile. That's the greatest fallacy that has confused many in their journey of healing relationships. You only reconcile, we only reconcile, when there has been ample reason for credible, credible trust to be restored. And trust, the trust journey, is, it's taken step by step, gradually. And what we need to do is allow for change in us, like Joseph did, and allow for change in the other party. And when there has been sufficient healing, and the restoration of sufficient love, uh, trust, there can be 
restoration. Some of us may be in the journey right now. We've jumped too quickly out of obligation and guilt to try to demonstrate a forgiveness in faith by a premature reconciliation. It may be a friendship, a business partnership. I don't know what it is. But be very careful. Remember, forgiveness is immediate. It triggers the healing in you and in them. But trust is restored over time. There are people I have forgiven. I have forgiven everybody I know of that's offended me. But I don't trust everyone that has offended me. I would be foolish to trust everyone I've forgiven until there is evidence of repentance and change. There are people I've forgiven, but I won't hang with. It doesn't obligate me to be their friend. But I keep my heart clean. I'll pray for them. I'll be cordial with them. I may even socialize with them occasionally. But until I am sure that they've changed to the degree that they are trustworthy, there will never be a total reconciliation. But there will always be forgiveness. Winning Super Bowl relationships traverse the journey of trust. Pastor Darren said our church is right by Pearl Harbor. I'm Japanese American, all right? So I, every day I look out right there. I mean, you, you know, Pearl Harbor is right there. And I am reminded every day that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. How ironic it is that I pastor a church right next to the place where my ancestors went berserk. <laughs> ironic is that, okay? Mitsuo Fuchida was the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. Mitsuo Fuchida, after Japanese lost the war, lost his marriage, he lost his purpose, got into depression, wanted to take his life, until he read a track written by Jacob DeShazer. Who was Jacob DeShazer? He was part of Doolittle's Raiders. He was so angry at the Japanese, he became part of that B-25 crew that went over to Nagoya and bombed Japan in the shadow of that attack on Pearl Harbor, which was an amazing miracle. Without going into a history lesson, they tricked out B-25s, put them on aircraft carriers that got close enough to Japan so that they would have enough fuel to get to Japan and release the bombs. It was moral, it was, it was, it was a restoration of moral, it gave a moral lift to America. They had to strip the bombers down entirely to reduce the weight to its irreducible minimum so that they could reach the continent. Well, DeShazer crashed. He crashed in China, was taken as a prisoner of war. During the time that he was a prisoner of war, others were shot to death. But his life was spared. They gave him a Bible. He read the Bible. The gospel got into him. He got saved. He began to treat his, his prison guards with kindness and love. Instead of looking at them as enemies, he looked at them as who Christ died for, and he forged a relationship with his enemy captors. The war ended. He was released. He went to Bible college, and he wrote a tract, a gospel tract. It was the tract that Mitsuo Fuchida read and came to Christ. The two men met. They bombed each other's countries. The Shazer became a missionary to Japan and planted churches in Nagoya. Mitsuo Fuchida's greatest work was as a missionary to America. And I believe you've seen the pictures. And if you hadn't, there they are. Big picture. This is what you call a reconciliation. Trust reclaimed because of the good news of the gospel. And we'll close with this. Big picture. See the big picture. See the big picture. We go to the opening text, which is summarized by the video clip. Joseph said to them, do not fear, for I am, in the, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. After 13 years, Joseph made it, he had gone from it being all about him to be it being all about the purpose of God. He was able to see that all things indeed work together for good 
He was no longer 17, he was 30. It took that long for his brothers to be changed and for him to be changed. And now he's saying, this is a good thing. What was a bad thing is a good thing. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Oh my God, if your family sold you to slavery, initially having thought maybe you should be killed for your arrogance, it would be a long journey to forgiveness. It would be a long journey to healing. It was a long journey for Joseph. But in the end, in the end, God used the pit, Potiphar's house, and the prison to bring Joseph to a place where his heart was fully healed. He could trust his brothers, and what was divided could be undivided. God's at work. He uses pits and prisons in our lives. You may be in one now. You may be in a place where relationships have been frayed. What you thought was going to work out has not worked out. Let's, let's, let, here's what God's doing. If you're in a place where things have not worked out, God is working out something in you to prepare you for something larger than yourself or that conflict. How do I know? That's what old Asian guys come to after being 44 years in the ministry. That's what. Okay? When you're old, you can say profound things and actually know what you're saying. Right, Pastor Darren? When we were young, when we were young, uh, we made stuff up. <laughs> we did. That's how it goes. Now we know. Now we speak from where, from where we've lived. And I want to encourage you as a crazy old Asian today. God is at work in your places of tension in all of your relationships. Yes, he is. You may not feel like it, but if you forgive, if you let him heal you, if you will reconcile or trust gradually and step back and see the big picture, you will find God has been, has been at work in the most disappointing, frustrating, confusing times in your journey. All of life is relationships. All of life is relationships. Um, when you look at Pearl Harbor, you step back. It was awful. It affected my family. My mother lives with us. She has Alzheimer's. She's going to be 90 in a couple of months. I love her dearly. I came to Christ because of her. Today, I have to tell her who I am every day. I have to tell her what I do every day. Sometimes I have to tell her who she is every day. But that's not who she is. Wonderful woman. Strong, strong woman. She had eight brothers. She was the only girl. They fought in the war. They enlisted in what was known as the 442nd Combat Regiment, 100th Infantry Battalion, the most decorated in American military history, not just modern military history, American military history, the most medals of honor, the most bronze stars and purple hearts. Japanese American. Spielberg needs to make a movie about my people. Yeah, Crazy Brave Asians, they should name that movie. And they need to do that. And so... My uncle, uh, one, of, one of her brothers, my uncle, had, did his funeral not too long ago. He lived in 94. And he was part of what is known as the 100th Battalion that went and rescued 275 Texans trapped on the Vosges Forest Mountains in France. It's one of the most vaunted battles that defined the courage of soldiers in the Second World War. Japanese Americans signed up, 10,000 plus, to prove their loyalty to America that were not Japanese were Japanese Americans, and so they gave their lives. Well, in this battle, the 100th Battalion had gone through a couple of engagements and were, were given a Sabbath, but they were called on again because two other units had failed to rescue these American soldiers at the top of the hill from Texas, from the South. Southerners hated the Japanese. Southerners were prejudiced against Japanese Americans and did not trust them. Well, a thousand of my uncle's battalion climbed the hill, and, and there he is. This is not him, but this is essentially what looks like him. This is a shot from the actual ascent. And he told me, Norman, I really don't know how I made that climb. To make a long story short, a thousand Japanese Americans out of the thousand, 800 lost their lives rescuing 275 Texans. Out of the 275 Texans, 211 made it down the mountain. And there were more of them than there were of the, of the Japanese Americans that ascended the hill to rescue them. My uncle's company went up with 
a thousand came back with 200. My uncle was one of them that lived. How ironic it was that there were more of those that they saved than those that were sent up for the rescue. What kept him centered was this. When he, they would go into the villages of France, he would collect all the chocolate from his soldier friends and he would, he would give them away to the kids. And so when they would enter the villages and the towns, they would flock to him. He was the chocolate man. And he would give away the chocolate to all these children and those faces reminded him of why he fought. Because tell you what, you go in with grand reasons, I'm fighting for my country, but at the end of the day, he says, when you're in a foxhole, you're fighting for the guy next to you. You're fighting for the guy you're with. Sounds like football. You play for the guy next to you. You play for the guy behind you. He lived because he, rem he, he remembered why he fought, who he was fighting for and why he was fighting and their relationships of trust. You have to trust the man with the rifle next to you. Got him through. For years, I would speak to the Southern Methodist University football team in Dallas. Uh, June Jones is a good friend of ours. Coach Jones is in our church, and so he was the coach. I'd be invited, and I'd talk to them. But I made friends with some billionaires there. And they invited me to a Rangers game the year they went to the World Series. And they said, we're going to go into the presidential suite. And... There was Nolan Ryan parked here, and there was the most successful sports executive here, and I walked in, and he says, we're going to put you, this is where President Bush, and I'm telling you, this, I was just moved by the fact that he passed, the older Bush. This is the president's seat. You're going to sit here, and we're just really glad and thankful that you're here. And I thought, wow, I'm a Japanese American. Southerners didn't like us back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But see, then I found something out. Everybody in Texas loves people that look like me because they know the story of the Lost Battalion. And as I sat there, they tapped me on the shoulders. Oh, one more thing. If the president comes in, you'll have to move to the seat to the right. <laughs> that sounded like such a ridiculous statement. I said, okay. And it was, I realized I was standing on the shoulders of my uncle's bravery. He was a brave man. But he had brave men around him who together understood with 200 left they would have to bond together and trust each other, undivided, to get those 211 Texas out, Texans out. When I did his funeral, it was emotional. Because I realized we all have to remember why we fight and who we fight. We don't fight one another. We fight for one another. Because Jesus fought for us when he went to the cross. Father, today, on this Super Bowl Sunday, many people will be watching two teams compete. But more importantly, they are successful because of trusted relationships in the locker room. Well, in this locker room of Brave Church, we pray that would be the same. And we pray, Lord, that in the journey, in the Joseph journeys we are in, you would trigger forgiveness which spawns healing and trust reconciliation that will bring you glory. Pour out your spirit today that in our journeys you will be glorified. Amen.